Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Steppenwolf by Herman Hesse. Dane reads. So uh, this is a Penguin Modern Classic. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs before sharing my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Herman Hesse's poetical novel, Steppenwolf, was written some 20 years before he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1946. This Faust-like and magical story of the humanization of a middle-aged misanthrope was described in the New York Times as a savage indictment of bourgeois society. But, as the author notes in this edition, Steppenwolf is a book which has been violently misunderstood. This self-portrait of a man who felt himself to be half human and half wolf can also be seen as a plea for rigorous self-examination and an indictment of intellectual hypocrisy. But I do want to read uh, one little line he has right at the end of his introduction where he says, Of course I neither can nor intend to tell my readers how they ought to understand my tale. May everyone find in it what strikes a chord in him and is of some use to him. But I would be happy if many of them were to realise that the story of the Steppenwolf pictures a disease and crisis, but not one leading to death and destruction, on the contrary to healing. And so here we have an interesting uh, paragraph here I want to read out. I think a, a lot of the readings as well that I want to share with you guys today are really to show you this like poetic style of writing. It's quite impressive considering it was translated from German and still kind of retains that. So uh, this is where we get to know a bit of the uh, Steppenwolf, Han Harry Haller. I have already given some account of the Steppenwolf's outward appearance. He gave at the very first glance the impression of a significant, an uncommon, and unusually gifted man. His face was intellectual, and the abnormally delicate and mobile play of his features reflected a soul of extremely emotional and an unusually delicate sensibility. When one spoke to him, and he, as was not always the case, dropped conventionalities and said personal and individual things that came out of his own alien world, then a man like myself came under his spell on the spot. He had thought more than other men, and in matters of the intellect he had that calm objectivity, that certainty of thought and knowledge, as only really intellectual men have, who lack ambition, who never wish to shine or to persuade others, or to or to appear always in the right. I remember an instance of this in the last days he was here, if I can call a mere fleeting glance he gave me an example of what I mean. It was when a celebrated historian and art critic, a man of European fame, had announced a lecture in the University Hall. I had succeeded in persuading the Steppenwolf to attend it, though at first he had little desire to do so. We went together and sat next to each other. When the lecturer ascended the platform and began his address, many of his listeners, who had expected a sort of profit, were disappointed by his rather spruce and conceited air. And when he proceeded, by way of introduction, to say a few flattering things to the audience, thanking them for their attendance in such numbers, the Steppenwolf threw me a quick look, a look which criticised both the words and the entire personality of the speaker, an unforgettable and frightful look which spoke volumes. It was a look that did not simply criticise that lecturer, annihilating the celebrated man with his crushing yet delicate irony. That was the least of it. It was more sad than ironical. It was indeed utterly and hopelessly sad. It conveyed a quiet despair born partly of conviction, partly of a mode of thought which had become habitual with him. This despair of his not only unmasked the conceited lecture and dismissed with its irony the matter at hand, the expectant attitude of the public, this somewhat presumptuous title under which the lecture was announced. No, the Steppenwolf's luck pierced a whole epoch, its whole overall activity, the whole surge and strife, the whole vanity, the whole superficial play of a shallow opinionated intellectuality. And alas, the look went still deeper, went far below the folds, defects and hopelessness of our time, our intellect, our culture alone. It went right to the heart of all humanity. It bespoke eloquently in a single second the whole despair of a thinker, of one who perhaps knew the whole worth and meaning of man's life. It said, see what monkeys we are, look, such is man. And at once all renown, all intelligence, all the attainments of the spirit, all progress towards the sublime, the great and the enduring in man, fell away and became a monkey's trick. And again a nice little excerpt here. What a fragrance there is here, the scent of floor polish with a fainter echo of turpentine blending with the mahogany and the washed leaves of the plants, of superlative bourgeois cleanliness, of care and precision, of a feeling of duty and devotion to little things. I don't know who lives here, but behind that door must be a paradise of cleanliness and spotless mediocrity, of ordered ways, a touching and anxious devotion to life's little habits and tasks. And uh, here again we have another big chunker, this is, a, this is all one paragraph, but again, considering I highlighted two different pages with the same paragraph on, I think there's a lot here to share. With playful lightheartedness, I trod the most pavements of the narrow streets. As though in tears and veiled, the lamps glimmered through the chill gloom and sucked their reflections slowly from the wet ground. The forgotten years of my youth came back to me. How I used to love the dark, sad evenings of late autumn and winter. How eagerly I imbibed their moods of loneliness and melancholy when wrapped in my cloak I strode for half the night through rain and storm, through the leafless winter landscape. Lonely enough then too, but full of deep joy and full of poetry which later I wrote down by candlelight on the edge of my bed. All that was past now. The cup was emptied and would never be filled again. Was that a matter for regret? 
No, I did not regret the past. My regret was for the present day, for all the countless hours and days that I lost in mere passivity and that brought me nothing, not even the shocks of awakening. But thank God there were exceptions. There were now and then, though rarely, the hours that brought the welcome shock, pulled down the walls and brought me back again from my wanderings to the living heart of the, of the world. Sadly, and yet deeply moved, I set myself to recall the last of these experiences. It was at a concert of lovely old music. After two or three notes of the piano, the door was opened all of a sudden to the other world. I sped through heaven and saw God at work. I suffered holy pains. I dropped all my defences and was afraid of nothing in the world. I accepted all things and to all things I gave up my heart. It did not last very long, a quarter of an hour perhaps, but it returned to me in a dream at night and since through all the barren days I caught a glimpse of it now and then. Sometimes for a minute or two I saw it clearly, threading my life like a divine and golden track, but nearly always it was blurred and dirt and dust. Then again it gleamed out in golden sparks as though never to be lost again and yet was soon quite lost once more. Once it happened, as I lay awake at night, that I suddenly spoke in verses, in verses so beautiful and strange that I did not venture to think of writing them down, and then in the morning they vanished, and yet they lay hidden within me like the hard kernel within an old brittle husk. Once it came to me while reading a poet, while pondering a thought of Descartes, of Pascal, again it shone out and drove its gold track far into the sky while I was in the presence of my beloved. Uh, it is hard to find this track of the divine in the midst of this life we lead, in this besotted humdrum age of spiritual blindness, with its architecture, its business, its politics, its men. How could I fail to be a lone wolf and an uncouth hermit, as I did not share one of its aims, nor understand one of its pleasures? I cannot remain for long in either theatre or movie. I can scarcely read a paper, seldom a modern book. I cannot understand what pleasure and joys there are that drive people to the overcrowded railways and hotels, into the packed cafes with the suffocating and obtrusive music, to the bars and variety entertainments, to world exhibitions, to the corsos. I cannot understand nor share these joys, though they are within my reach, for which thousands of others strive. On the other hand, what happens to me in my rare hours of joy, what for me is bliss and life and ecstasy and exultation, the world in general seeks at most in works of fiction. In life, it finds it absurd. And in fact, if the world is right, if this music of the cafes, these mass enjoyments and these Americanized men who are pleased with so little are right, then I am wrong, I am crazy. I am in truth the steppenwolf that I often call myself, the beast astray who finds neither home nor joy nor nourishment in a world that is strange and incomprehensible to him. We get a throwaway reference to Ophelia, which I thought was cool because I watched the movie with the same, same name recently. And so then we get um, a book called The Treatise on the Steppenwolf, not for everybody. And, uh, this is basically the start of that. Again, another paragraph I'm going to read. He likes his long paragraphs, but I think that might be a, a side effect of translating it from German. There was once a man, Harry, called the Steppenwolf. He went on two legs, wore clothes, and was a human being. Nevertheless, he really was a wolf of the steppes. He had learned a great deal of everything that people with a fair mind can, and he was a rather clever fellow. What he had not learned, however, was this, to find contentment in himself and his own life. The cause of this, apparently, was that at the bottom of his heart he knew all the time, or thought he knew, that he was in reality not a man, but a wolf of the steppes. Clever men might argue the point whether he truly was a wolf, whether he had been changed before birth perhaps from a wolf into a human being, or had been given the soul of a wolf though born as a human being, or whether, on the other hand, this belief that he was a wolf was no more than fancy or a disease of his. It might, for example, be possible that in his childhood he was wild and disobedient and disorderly, and that those who brought him up had declared a war of extinction against the beast in him, and precisely this had given him the idea and the belief that he actually was a beast with only a thin veneer of the human. On this point one could speak at length and entertainingly, and indeed write a book about it. The Steppenwolf, however, would be none the better for it, since for him it was all the same whether the wolf had been bewitched or beaten into him, or whether it was merely an idea of his own. What others chose to think about it, or what he chose to think himself, was no good to him at all. It left the wolf inside him just the same. And a little more on that, and this talks on like the nature of happiness. For me, as like a depressed, disillusioned 30-something, this is basically the catcher in the rye for slightly older people. Thus it was then with the Steppenwolf, and one may well imagine that Harry did not have an exactly pleasant and happy life of it. This does not mean, however, that he was unhappy in any extraordinary degree, although it may have seemed so to himself all the same, inasmuch as every man takes the sufferings that fall to his share as the greatest. That cannot be said of any man. Even he who has no wolf in him may be none the happier for that. And even the unhappiest life has its sunny moments and its little flowers of happiness between sand and stone. So it was with the Steppenwolf too. It cannot be denied that he was generally very unhappy, and he could make others unhappy also, that is, when he loved them or they loved him. For all who got to love him saw always only the one side in him. Many loved him as a refined and clever and interesting man, and were horrified and disappointed when they had come upon the wolf in him. And they had to, because Harry wished, as every sentient being does, to be loved as a whole, and therefore it was just with those whose love he most valued that he could least of all conceal and belie the wolf. 
There were those, however, who loved precisely the wolf in him, the free, the savage, the untamable, the dangerous and strong. And these found it particularly disappointing and deplorable when suddenly the wild and wicked wolf was also a man and had hankerings after goodness and refinement and wanted to hear Mozart, to read poetry and to cherish human ideals. Usually these were the most disappointed and angry of all. And so it was that the Steppenwolf brought his own jewel and divided nature into the destinies of others whenever he came into contact with them. So here we have some stuff on the nature of art that I want to read out. And um, I can tell you that these are definitely worth reading because I don't know if you can see. Yeah, just about. Um, the, whoever owned this before me took lots of notes in pencil. I can't actually really read the handwriting. In this connection, one thing more must be said. There are a good many people of the same kind as Harry, particularly many artists are of this kind. These persons all have two souls, two beings within them. There is God and the devil in them, the mother's blood and the father's, the capacity for happiness and the capacity for suffering. And in just such a state of enmity and entanglement with the wolf and man in Harry, live at times in their rare moments of happiness with such strength and indescribable beauty. The spray of their moment's happiness is flung so high and dazzlingly over the wide sea of suffering that the light of it spreading its radiance touches others too with its enchantment. Thus, like a precious fleeting foam over the sea of suffering, arise all those works of art in which a single individual lifts himself for an hour so high above his personal destiny that his happiness shines like a star and appears to all who see it as something internal and as their own dream of happiness. All these men, whatever their deeds and works may be, have really no life. That is to say, their lives are non-existent and have no form. They are not heroes, artists or thinkers in the same way that other men are judges, doctors, shoemakers or schoolmasters. Their life consists of a perpetual tide, unhappy and torn with pain, terrible and meaningless, unless one is ready to see its meaning in just those rare experiences, acts, thoughts and works that shine out above the chaos of such a life. To such men the desperate and horrible thought has come that perhaps the whole of human life is but a bad joke, a violent and ill-fated abortion of the primal mother, a savage and dismal catastrophe of nature. To them too, however, the other thought has come that man is perhaps not merely a half-rational animal, but a child of the gods and destined to immortality. I see so much of myself in this book. And so here is a bit more about the Steppenwolf. It still remains to elucidate the Steppenwolf as an isolated phenomenon in his relation to the bourgeois world so that his symptoms may be traced to their source. Let us take as a starting point, since it offers itself, his very relation to the bourgeoisie. To take his own view of the matter, the Steppenwolf stood entirely outside the world of convention, since he had neither family life nor social ambitions. He felt himself to be single and alone, whether as a queer fellow and a morbid hermit, or as a person removed from the common run of men by the prerogative of talents that had something of genius in them. Deliberately, he looked down upon the ordinary man and was proud that he was not one. Nevertheless, his life in many aspects was thoroughly ordinary. He had money in the bank and supported poor relations. He was dressed respectably and inconspicuously, even though without particular care. He was glad to live on good terms with the police and the tax collectors and other such powers. Besides this, he was secretly and persistently attracted to the little bourgeois world, to those quiet and respectable homes with tidy gardens, irreproachable staircases, and their whole modest air of order and comfort. It pleased him to set himself outside it, with his little vices and extravagances, as a queer fellow or a genius, but he never had his domicile in those providences of life where the bourgeoisie had ceased to exist. He was not at ease with violent and exceptional persons, nor with criminals and outlaws, and he took up his abode always among the middle classes, with whose habits and standards and atmosphere he stood in a constant relation, even though it might be one of contrast and revolt. Moreover, he had been brought up in a provincial and conventional home, and many of the notions and much of the examples of those days had never left him. In theory, he had nothing whatever against prostitution, yet in practice it would have been beyond him to take a harlot quite seriously as his equal. He was capable of loving the political criminal, the revolutionary or intellectual seducer, the outlaw of state and society, as his brother. But as for theft and robbery, murder and rape, he would not have known how to deplore them otherwise than in a thoroughly bourgeois manner. I mean, I think deploring especially murder and rape, that's not really a bourgeois thing, that's a human thing, mate. We get a reference, to, well, we get this, I'll read it out. Uh, For there is not a single human being, not even the primitive negro, not even the idiot, who is so conveniently simple that his being can be explained as the sum of two or three principal elements. I don't know about that, simple negro, primitive negro, Jesus Christ. Mind you, he was German. Is, is that racist to say that? No, that's, um, what, xenophobic, isn't it? And so we get a little information about the narrator. He says, I lived, however, quite by myself and was no longer fit for decent society. For in the first place, I was nearly always in a bad temper and afflicted with the gout. And in the second place, usually drunk. Sounds like me before I quit drinking. And um, a little bit of a memento mori here. My 82 years showed just as conclusively that we must all die in the end as if I had died as a schoolboy. I should point out as well that as well as Harry, the main character, we have uh, Herman, 
but uh, I guess in some editions it's been translated as Hermione. I guess Hermine is probably the German equivalent of Hermione. But so a lot of people have pointed out that it's got Harry and Hermione in it. No Ron though. And um, great little exchange of dialogue here. So uh, Hermine had listened attentively. Yes, she said now. There you're right enough. Of course there will be another war. One doesn't need to read the papers and know that. And of course one can be sad about it, but it isn't any use. It is just the same as when a man is sad to think that one day, in spite of his utmost efforts to prevent it, he will inevitably die. The war against death, dear Harry, is always a beautiful, noble and wonderful and glorious thing, and so, it follows, is the war against war. But it is always hopeless and chaotic too. That is perhaps true, I cried heatedly, but truth like that, Though we must all soon be dead and so it is all one and the same, make the whole of life flat and stupid. Are we then to throw everything up and renounce the spirit altogether and all effort and all that is human and let ambition and money rule forever while we await the next mobilisation over a glass of beer? Again, that's one of the lines that I think is very relevant still today. This bit made me chuckle. No doubt there was cocaine in the powder. Herman told me that Pablo had many such drugs and that he procured them through secret channels. He offered them to his friends now and then and he was a master in the mixing and prescribing of them. He had drugs for stilling pain, for inducing sleep, for begetting beautiful dreams, lively spirits and the passion of love. Like, inducing sleep with cocaine? I would think that would induce you to go and punch somebody in the head. And this is just, a, I guess, an interesting thing of the societal mores at the time because you wouldn't really get this now, at least in the West. In the morning, after we had shared breakfast, I had to smuggle Maria from the house. Later in the same day, I took a little room in a neighbouring quarter which was designed solely for our meetings. True to her duties, Herman, my dancing mistress, appeared and I had to learn the Boston. She was firm and inexorable and would not release me from a single lesson, for it was decided that I was to attend the fancy dress ball in her company. She had asked me for money for her costume, but she refused to tell me anything about it. To visit her, or even to know where she lived, was still forbidden me. Alright, so I always enjoy it when uh, books reference drugs, and here we have Pablo saying, You're so very unhappy. That is bad. One shouldn't be like that. It makes me sorry. Try a mild pipe of opium. Yes, try a little bit of heroin, a little bit of heroin. And then we get, uh, I sat entranced. Entranced, I felt for a pencil in my waistcoat pocket and looking for paper saw the wine card lying on the table. I turned it over and wrote on the back. I wrote verses and forgot about them till one day I discovered them in my pocket. They ran, the immortals, and I'm gonna read this out. Ever reeking from the bales of earth, a sense to was life's fevered surge. Wealth's excess, the rage of dearth, smoke of death meals on the gallows verge. Greed without end, spasmodic lust. Murderer's hands, usurer's hands, hands of prayer. Exhales in fetid breath the human swarm. Whipped on by fear and lust, blood raw, blood warm. Breathing blessedness and savage beats. Eating itself and spewing what it eats. Hatching war and lovely art. Decking out with idiot craze. Bawdy houses while they blaze. Through the childish fair time mart. Weltering to its own decay. In the glare of pleasure's way. Rising for each newborn and then. Sinking for each to dust again. But we above you evermore residing. In the ether's star translumined ice. No not day nor night nor times dividing. Where not age nor sex for our device. All your sins and anguish self-affrighting, your murders and levitious delighting, are to us but as a show, like the suns that circling go, let the longest day be day and night. On your frenzied life we spy, and refresh ourselves thereafter, with the stars in order fleeing. Our breath is winter in our sight, fawns the dragon of the sky, cool and unchanging is our eternal being, cool and star bright is our eternal laughter. And we get another reference to cocaine, so I fixed my eyes on the little mirror where the man Harry and the wolf were going through their convulsions. For a moment there was a convulsion deep within me too, a faint but painful one like remembrance, or like homesickness, or like remorse. Then the slight oppression gave way to a new feeling like that a man feels when a tooth has been extracted with cocaine. A sense of relief and of letting out a deep breath and of wonder at the same time, that it is not hurt in the least. And this feeling was accompanied by a buoyant exhilaration and a desire to laugh so irresistible that I was compelled to give way to it. And then we have a series of uh, inscriptions, so I'm going to read these out. Uh... Once more I stood in the round corridor, still excited by the hunting adventure, and everywhere on all the countless doors were the alluring inscriptions. Mutabor, transformation into any animal or plant you please. Karma Sutram, instruction in the Indian arts of love course for beginners. 42 different methods and practices. Delightful suicide, you laugh yourself to bits. Do you want to be your spirit? The wisdom of the east. Downfall of the west, moderate prices never surpassed. Compendium of art, transformation from time into space by means of music. Laughing tears, cabinet of humour, solitude made easy, complete substitute for all forms of sociability. The series of inscriptions was endless. One was, 
guidance in the building up of the personality, success guaranteed. So yeah, overall, uh, I've joked to my other half that Steppenwolf is basically the INTJ personality type in a book, which is what my Myers-Briggs personality type is, although take that with a pinch of salt because they've been described as horoscopes for uh, college educated people. But yeah, Steppenwolf by Herman Hesse, I thought it was fantastic. I gave this a strong 4.5 out of 5 and it's a contender for one of my books of the year. Um, this probably isn't the best edition to get hold of it, so if you can get yourself a nice edition, even better. And I'd love to be able to read the original in German, but my German is not that good yet. Das ist nicht so gut, ja? Ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch, aber ich kann nicht leer. Alright, so on that note, as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of Steppenwolf by Hermann Hesse, or Hess. Uh, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.